Hi everyone, my name is FlygonHG, and this is the video of my attempt at a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Platinum using only cute Pokemon. To see what I define as hardcore Nuzlocke rules, check out the description below. But in short, no items in battle, no overleveling past the gym leader's ace, and we're playing on set mode. Now, I know what you're thinking. What constitutes a cute Pokemon? Whether a Pokemon is cute or not is highly subjective, and in the eye of the beholder. Who am I to judge a Pokemon on its appearance and deem whether it's worthy of being called cute or not? Someone else's cute is another person's unholy abomination. Take pugs, for example. Some people think that pugs are adorable. I happen to think that they look like the love child of a praying mantis and a loaf of whole wheat bread. But everyone is entitled to their opinions. So in order to avoid any type of pug situation, I decided to use the most conservative and objective definition to define whether a Pokemon was cute or not cute. In Pokemon Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum, there's an area in the north of Hartham City called Amity Square. And in Amity Square, trainers are able to walk alongside their Pokemon. But unlike in Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver, which lets you walk around with any old Joe Schmo of a Pokemon, Amity Square was pretty picky with their guest list. They only let the cutest of the cute Pokemon out of their Pokeballs. In Pokemon Diamond and Pearl, there were only 14 Pokemon deemed cute enough to walk with. In Pokemon Platinum, you are also able to walk with the evolved forms of your starters. But when you consider that four of the Pokemon that had Amity Square privileges aren't actually accessible until the postgame, there's only 10 total Pokemon that you can go for a walk with. And you'd be pretty surprised who was left off the guest list. Eevee? Budu? Togepi? Bidoof? All too ugly. No alibis. So it's these 10 Game Freak approved cutie pies that made up the encounters for this challenge. I decided that I would be able to evolve all of these Pokemon to their final forms, but not until I went on a walk with them at least once in Amity Park. Unfortunately, based on this arbitrary rule, it meant that I couldn't actually use Blissey, because you can't catch Happiny in the wild until during the postgame in Mr. Backlot's garden. You can catch Chansey, but at that point, she's too ugly to go for a walk with. So, no Blissey. Which is actually fine with me, since Blissey is a pretty busted Nuzlocke encounter. Anyways, I also can obviously only choose one of the three starters, so in total, that leaves just seven encounters, which is pretty low, so I'll need to be careful not to make too many mistakes, or else I'm not going to have a full team. But there is a relatively decent amount of type coverage in this challenge, and I was able to catch most of them pretty early in the challenge, so this was a fun one. It did have some surprising challenges, though. Just as a quick reminder before we start, I play with Species Claws, so I'll be able to reroll encounters until I get a unique encounter, but I can only use one of each unique evolution line. Okay, let's see how this goes. I start the challenge by choosing my cute starter. I can pick any of the three since they're all eligible encounters, but I go with Turtwig because I've used Chimchar and Piplup in previous challenges recently. Fortunately, all three of the starters in this game are pretty excellent choices. But Torterra, despite being my personal favorite, is probably the least excellent. It does get early Earthquake, but that's made kind of redundant by the fact that you can actually get the TM for Earthquake before the fourth gym in Pokemon Platinum. And a laughable number of the major battles in Platinum are against a Pokemon with an Ice-type move, which makes it a bit dangerous to use Torterra in most battles. But for now, our Turtwig is just a cute little grass-type turtle. I name him Smiley Face. And with that, our journey for the cutest team in the world begins. It's not too long before I get to Ravage Path and catch my second team member, an adorable little yellow chicken, Psyduck. I name him Colin D, and Colin D is going to carry a significant portion of this challenge. Golduck is an incredibly underrated Pokemon. Next up, it's time for our first gym battle, but Rourke's rock types aren't too much of an issue here. Smiley Face starts by setting up a few withdraws on Rourke's Geodude. After the Geodude gets a critical hit rock throw, Smiley Face knocks it out with an absorb and gets most of its health back. Then Onyx comes out. It hits a really weak rock throw, and then Absorb leaves it with a sliver. So Rourke goes for a potion, but another Absorb finishes it off. Last is Cranidos, but it goes down to two Razor Leaves, winning us an easy first gym badge. From here, I head to Floroma Town, and Smiley Face manages to evolve into Grottle. He's still cute enough for Amity Square, though. Before I'm able to continue my gym challenge, though, I have to help Nameless Child save her Nameless Father from Valley Windworks. This means fighting Galactic Commander Mars and her Perugly, the antithesis of everything this challenge stands for. So I make sure to level up Smiley Face and Colin D to level 20 before taking her on. Colin D is able to knock out her Zubat in one shot with a critical hit confusion. Then Perugly comes out, and Colin D flinches immediately from the fake out. Then I go for two tail whips as Perugly hits two scratches, which leaves me sitting at 21 HP. 
After doing some admittedly very simple math very incorrectly, I go for a rock smash because I assume that I'm not in critical hit range. But I definitely was. I go unpunished though because Perugly doesn't get the critical hit. So I switch to Smiley Face and finish off the Perugly with a Razor Leaf. With that taken care of, Drifloon will now show up outside of Valley Windworks on Fridays. So, obviously, I just patiently wait for a few days for it to be Friday in real life, and then I turn on my very real Nintendo DS to catch my third team member, the ghostly balloon that is as cute as he is upsettingly terrifying. I name him parentheses apostrophe x apostrophe parentheses. Now, as funny as I personally think it would be to consistently call Drifloon by his full legal name, I feel like most viewers won't find it that funny. It's also really hard to say quickly, so we'll just call him Paxap. Next up, I head to Route 205 and catch a Pachirisu, who really is just so freaking cute. I name him Colon 3. Then I go to Eterna Forest and fight a Baneri. I name him N Ellipses N. I wanted to name him N underscore N, but I guess there's actually no underscore in Pokemon Platinum. So N Ellipses N will have to do. Finally, I also go east of Eterna City into Mount Coronet, where I catch a Cleffa. I wouldn't be caught dead walking in Amity Square with this disgusting excuse for a Pokemon. But I name her Ubu, and then after a few levels, he evolves into the most adorable Pokemon of all, Clefairy. With that, we've got a full team, and now it's time to face off against Gardenia. I lead Paxap, and she leads Turtwig. Good choice, Gardenia. Paxap takes out the Turtwig with two gusts, as it just sets up a reflect. Then Cherim comes out. It uses Safeguard as I hit a gust, and then it goes for a Magical Leaf as a second gust leaves it in the red. Gardenia uses a Super Potion as Paxap just keeps spamming gust. Apparently we've been losing speed ties on the last few turns, because on this next turn I go first to hit a gust, but then Cherim gets off a leech seed. So I switch to smiley face. I go for a curse as Cherim sets up a safeguard. Then Cherim hits a surprisingly strong grass knot as I get greedy and go for another curse. Grass knot does damage based on weight, and smiley face is a pretty chonky boy, so this was kind of a mistake. I managed to finish off the Cherim, but now I'm way too low health to be able to survive a critical hit grass knot from Gardenia's Roserade. So I switch to Paxap, who tanks a Grass Knot. Magical Leaf does a huge chunk on the next turn though, as Paxap retaliates with a very weak Gust. I went from 43 to 22 HP here, so I can definitely survive another hit, but I'm risking a critical hit. There's not much else I can do though, so I just go for it. But... Roserade high rolls with Magical Leaf, knocking out Paxap. Things aren't looking great. I bring out Colon 3 to hit an incredibly weak Swift. Then I decide to just go for a few Hail Marys and try to paralyze Roserade with Spark. But it doesn't work. So I switch to Uwu and go for another Hail Mary with Sing. Which misses. So Uwu goes down to a Magical Leaf. So I bring in Smiley Face, who is able to just barely tank a non-critical hit Grass Knot and finish off the Roserade with a Return. This does mean that had I just clicked Return with Smiley Face when the Roserade first came out, I would have just won the battle. But that would have required dodging a crit, and there really was no guarantee that that was going to happen. I tried to play safer, but clearly I just didn't come prepared, and I lost two Pokemon because of it. Since this is relatively early in the game, I decide to just reset the run here and move on to attempt two. I can get back to Gardenia pretty quickly. But doing things quickly often means doing them recklessly, and in attempt two, that manifests in losing colon three to a critical hit tackle from a random wild Bidoof. Not my best moment. Okay, so I take a bit of a break before doing attempt 3, and I manage to get back to Gardenia without any problems. Here's the new team of cuties. Not too many changes, other than Uwu and Colon 3 are now both females. Some of the abilities are different too. Uwu now has the ability Magic Guard, which is a phenomenal ability that prevents her from taking damage from anything but direct attacking moves. We'll see why that's so great later. Unfortunately, it comes at the expense of Paxap having Aftermath instead of Unburden which is definitely the worst of the two abilities. And also, N Ellipses N has the ability Klutz, which is literally one of the worst abilities that a Pokemon can have, since it means that he just can't use items. It's horrible. Well, anyways, I have a bit of a strategy for Gardenia now, so things should go better. I lead Uwu this time and hit Turtwig with a Wake Up Slap as it goes for a Reflect. Then I use Encore to lock him into Reflect. This lets me switch to Grottle and set up two Curses. Unfortunately, the way Reflect and Encore shake out, Turtwig is able to set up another Reflect as the first one fades, and also hit a few Grass Knots as I go for some more Curses. But eventually, Turtwig goes down to a Return, and then Roserade comes out. It hits a Stun Spore, and I get fully paralyzed. Fortunately, I don't on the next turn, so Roserade does go down. 
last is Cherim, and I get fully paralyzed again, so I have to switch to Paxap. Cherim puts up a fight by hitting a critical hit magical leaf, using a super potion, and setting up Leech Seed, but eventually Paxap comes out on top, winning us a surprisingly difficult second gym battle. Next up, it's the always scary Galactic Commander Jupiter fight. Her skun tank loves to crit, so you gotta be careful. I lead Colon 3, who immediately takes out the Zubat with a spark. Then the skun tank comes out. I hit it with a charm as it goes for a screech. But because of the screech, a critical hit will now definitely kill, so I switch to Colon D, who tanks a Night Slash. Skun tank uses screech again as I use Tail Whip. Then it's back to Colon 3. Skun tank hits a poison gas, but a Petra Berry cures Colon 3. I use Spark as Skun Tank uses Night Slash. Then, a second Spark paralyzes Skun Tank as it just misses a Poison Gas. And then a third Spark crits. How ironic. From here, I make my way to Hartham City and get access to Amity Square. And one by one, I go on magical little walks with my adorable Pokémon. You know, there's something about seeing them outside their Pokéballs in their little overworld forms that really makes me connect with each and every one of them. At some point during our brief walks through this magical park, there's a change. A connection is made. They aren't just pixels on a screen anymore. I feel like I know each and every one of them. Smiley Faced is a lovable brute who enjoys basking in the sun and rolling in the fields. Colin D is a quiet but compassionate introvert who cares so much about others' feelings that it will literally give him headaches when he thinks about his teammates being upset. Paxap, despite being wanted for child abduction in several municipal cities, is truly a sweetheart that will fight to the death for his family. Colin 3 is an energetic munchkin, whose excessively large and fluffy tail is only outmatched by the size of his heart. Uwu is the manifestation of innocence and kindness, gracing everyone around her with her optimism and support. And last, but certainly not least, N Ellipses N may be a klutz, but he never lets down his team. These aren't just Pokemon, they're companions friends. And as we stroll through Amity Park, there's a peaceful stillness to these moments between us friends. But then suddenly, a cold gust of wind sends a shiver down my spine, and I come to a horrible realization. The trees of Amity Park start to fade in color. There's an eerie feeling in the air now. My friends. Not all of them will make it. It's only a matter of time until fate steps in, and the merciless brutality of the Nuzlocke takes one or more of them away from me. If only we could stay in Amity Park forever, safe within its boundaries. But that's not how this works. There's nothing for us in Amity Square. No life worth living is ever truly safe. And try as we might, we don't get unlimited time. We get moments, brief moments in time with the ones we love. The only thing we can do is find the beauty in those moments and make the most of them, no matter how short they are. For is it not the ephemeral nature of these moments that makes life so beautiful? So, after a few more laps around Amity Square, we leave, and our journey continues. While training up to the level cap, N Ellipses N evolves into Lopunny, and then it's time for Fantina. She leads a Duskull, and I lead Colin D. Colin D hits a Water Pulse, which confuses, causing Duskull to hit himself in confusion. I switch to Uwu, and then the Moron hits himself in confusion again. A Magical Leaf leaves Duskull in the red, so Fantina heals as I hit another Magical Leaf. Then I switch back to Colin D. I hit a Water Pulse, and then switch to Ubu, who gets hit with a Will-O-Wisp. But thanks to Magic Guard, she doesn't take damage from the burn. And the burn is actually pretty important. We'll see why in a sec. So, a few more Magical Leafs knock out the Duskull, and then Haunter comes out. So I switch to N Ellipses N, who gets hit with a Confuse Ray. Then I switch back to Ubu. And I do this repeatedly. See, Fantina's Haunter knows Confuse Ray, Hypnosis, Sucker Punch, and Shadow Claw. This means that the only thing that it can do to my normal types is use Confuse Ray, Hypnosis, and Sucker Punch. Sucker Punch only does damage if I'm using an attacking move. And since Uwu is burned, it will never use Hypnosis on Uwu. So I can safely switch between Uwu and N Ellipses N until Haunter is completely out of Sucker Punch and Confuse Ray PP. If there's one takeaway from all of this ridiculousness, it's that immunities in Hardcore Nuzlocks are incredible to have for pivoting and cheesing certain battles like this. Driftblim, for example, has three immunities, which makes it a really great Nuzlocke encounter. Anyways, after Haunter is out of PP, I'm able to safely set up Cosmic Powers with Uwu, and then knock out Haunter with a few Magical Leafs without the risk of hurting myself in confusion. It does take forever because Uwu isn't exactly the strongest attacker, but eventually the Haunter goes down. It may have been a bit overkill, but I needed everyone as healthy as possible in case Fantina's last Pokémon gets unreasonably lucky. Speaking of, Miss Magius comes out and instantly hits a Confuse Ray. 
Uwu does manage to break through the confusion, but only to miss a sing. Then Miss Magius goes for Magical Leaf as Uwu breaks through confusion again to hit an Encore. Now that Miss Magius is stuck using Magical Leaf, it's safe to switch to Smiley Face and take it out with a critical hit bite. If there's a second takeaway from this battle, it's that Encore is a busted move. Anyways, after this we have a rival battle, but he's still super easy, so I'll just skip over all the fights with Ugly until they become more difficult. By the time we get to Maylene and her fighting types, Paxap has evolved into Driftblim, and Smiley Face has evolved into Torterra, and learned Earthquake, which is pretty ridiculous for this early in the game. Maylene leads Metatite, and I lead Colon 3. I start with a Protect because Metatite knows Fake Out, but it uses Rock Tomb. So on the next turn, I hit it with a Charm. Then I switch to Smiley Face, who takes a Rock Tomb. Then I set up a Leech Seed to keep me healthy as I use Curse. Metatite switches to Confusion, so now I'm running the risk of Confusion, which happens right as I kill the Metatite. I actually would have preferred to hit myself in Confusion there instead of killing it, because then I could have easily switched out and back in to shake off the Confusion. Unfortunately though, Lucario comes out, and I really can't risk hitting myself in Confusion. So I switch to Paxap, who's immune to the Force Palm. Then it's back to Smiley Face, who tanks a Metal Claw. Fortunately, Lucario didn't get an attack boost from Metal Claw, because on the next turn he hits a critical hit Drain Punch. But Smiley Face is bulky enough to tank it, so an Earthquake knocks out Lucario in one shot. But we're not totally out of the woods yet. Macho comes out last, and I switch to Colon 3 as he uses Focus Energy. Then I use Charm as Macho goes for a Rock Tomb. I protect to scout out Macho's move choice, which is Karate Chop, so I switch to Paxap. But he goes for a Rock Tomb. I'm still gonna outspeed it though, so I go for an Ominous Wind. And then Macho uses Rock Tomb again. It crits, but we survive. That was calculated though, as is the switch to Analypsis N who kills Macho with a return. Even if the Rock Tomb hadn't missed, we still would have outsped it, and return always kills from that range. So, that's badge number four. Soon after that, Colin D evolves into Jolduck, who as I said, will be invaluable for the latter half of this challenge run. Then I catch my final encounter, a hideously disfigured Pichu from Mr. Backlot's garden. I name her Colin Parentheses. After pretending to be Colin Parentheses' friend for just a little bit, she evolves into the Amity Square approved cutie, Pikachu. So we go for a walk, and I try my best to ignore the impending feeling of loss. Once Colin Parentheses learns Thunderbolt, I shove a Thunderstone down her throat, and she evolves into Raichu, whose Platinum Sprite is a spiritual successor of Fat Pikachu. Look at how chunky it is. I love it. Now, it's time for Crash Awake, and you'd think that with two Electric types and a Grass type, that he should be pretty easy for me to handle, right? That's what I thought, at least. Floatzel is really fast and has Ice Fang, so it isn't the easiest thing in the world, but I figured I can just use Encore from Uwu and make this a really easy victory. I lead Colon Parentheses into Crasher Wake's Gyarados, and immediately knock it out with a Thunderbolt. Then Quagsire comes out. So I switch to Uwu, since she can easily outspeed and knock this thing out with a Magical Leaf. But the Mud Shot lowers her speed on the switch-in. So Quagsire outspeeds and hits me with a Water Pulse. Which confuses me, and causes me to hit myself in confusion. So I switch to Smiley Face to shake off the confusion as Quagsire hits a Yawn. I don't want to fall asleep, so I switch back to Uwu, who gets hit by a critical hit water pulse, which confuses me again. This is so stupid. It's literally the third gym battle in a row that I've had to deal with confusion. So with Uwu being so low, I just have to switch her out here. This also makes Floatzel a lot harder. But for now, I switch to Smiley Face, tank a mud shot, which crits, because why not? And then I finally razor leaf the tryhard Quagsire for a one shot. Floatzel comes out next and I'm dead to a critical hit Ice Fang, so it's time for a switch to Colon D. I swear, if that Ice Fang had frozen me, I would have completely lost it. Floatzel hits a Crunch, which crits, and lowers my defense, so now I'm dead to another Crunch. So I gotta switch to Smiley Face to tank a Crunch. This baits an Ice Fang, which will do less damage to Colon 3 and doesn't risk the defense drop, though a freeze would be pretty devastating. Fortunately, we get in relatively free. And after tanking a crunch, a final discharge wins us an insanely stupid gym badge. A few high roll crunch crits would have killed us there, so that was a bit of a risk, but at that point, I didn't really have any other play. That's badge number five. Well, now that Crasher Wake's been defeated, I'm able to get Surf, which means I can finally get a Moonstone. I use it to evolve Uwu into Clefable, which will give her a lot more bulk for the next few gyms. Before getting to the sixth gym leader, though, Ugly challenges me to a battle on the Canalave Bridge, using Terabithia rules. Loser gets thrown into the raging waters below. Normally this battle still isn't particularly difficult, but Ugly has recently gotten a Heracross, 
which is a very strong Pokemon with decent speed and solid bulk. The only Pokemon on my team that can resist his stab Brick Break is Paxap, but Heracross also knows Night Slash, so it's pretty difficult to play around critical hits here. Fortunately, at least this time, Paxap is able to take out Heracross with a Choice Specs boosted Gust. Gust is so weak that even with Heracross's times 4 weakness, the Choice Specs was necessary. Unfortunately, Gust is Paxap's only special flying move, so it's not going to be a great long-term solution. After Heracross goes down, though, Floatzel comes out. So I switch to colon parentheses as Floatzel uses Pursuit, but even a critical hit Pursuit wouldn't have been enough to knock out Paxap. Colon parentheses knocks out the Floatzel on the next turn with the Thunderbolt, after it just uses Aqua Jet for a chunk of damage. Then Infernape comes out. This thing is also pretty scary, since it's speedy and pretty powerful. So I switch to Paxap on a Brick Break, then pivot to colon D on a Flame Wheel. From here, colon D takes a Brick Break, and then hits a Surf to knock out Infernape in one shot. That fighting type immunity on Paxap is pretty incredible to have. Anyways, Roserade is last, so I switch to Uwu, who tanks a Giga Drain. Then I use Encore to lock Roserade into Toxic Spikes. From here, it's a safe switch into Paxap, who knocks out the Roserade with two Shadow Balls. See ya, ugly. Now it's time for Byron, but Byron is almost never particularly difficult. By this point in the run, I usually have Choice Specs and a pretty strong Surf user. In Platinum, Byron leads Magneton, which makes things a little harder, but only barely. I lead Smileyface, who has just enough speed EVs to outspeed the three Magnemides super glued together, so he knocks it out with a single Earthquake. Steelix is out next, and has Ice Fang, so it's a pretty safe switch to Colon D, so long as it doesn't freeze. Okay, sweet. A Surf takes out Steelix in one shot, then last is Bastiodon, but his ugly mug is just another big fat target for Colon D to hit with a Surf. And that's Byron defeated. From here, we gotta go follow Team Galactic around the map and do a few boss fights. I usually don't show these because they aren't particularly difficult, but I did want to show this clip from the Saturn fight because Paxap almost dies. For some reason, I had a brain fart and thought that Toxicroak was times 4 weak to flying instead of Psychic. A critical hit feint attack would have absolutely killed Paxap, so that was a very dangerous mistake to make. I just figured I'd show this because it's a good reminder that it's almost impossible to play perfectly in a Nuzlocke. Dumb mistakes like this happen all the time, and you kinda just gotta adapt. So if you ever find yourself in a situation where you've made a huge mistake, just know that you're not alone, and that everybody makes mistakes. Everybody has those days. Everybody knows what, what I'm talking about. Everybody gets that way. Nobody's perfect. Anyways, during some training for the 7th gym leader, I find a shiny Geodude. But it's too ugly for our team, so Analypsis N just punches it in the face and it dies. Blech. Now it's time for Candace, who is actually pretty tough, especially in Platinum. Her team hits really hard. She's usually able to be taken out with a strong fire type, but all fire types are ugly, so I'm out of luck. Analypsis N can learn Fire Punch, but he's not strong enough to even one-shot the Abama Snow without a boost from an item. And Abama Snow can retaliate with a Focus Blast, which has 100% accuracy when the AI uses it, but only about 20% accuracy when the player uses it. Candace's double teaming Snowcloak Frostlass is also a massive problem, since it's very fast and can hit very hard with Blizzard and Shadow Ball. Fortunately, Uwu is relatively bulky, doesn't take damage from Hail thanks to Magic Guard, and can learn Flamethrower. Colon D also has Cloud 9 as an ability, which negates the effects of Weather and Snowcloak, so it's not totally hopeless. Candace leads Sneasel, and I lead Analypsis N. He's able to just barely outspeed the Sneasel and knock it out with a Drain Punch. Obama Snow comes out next, so I switch to Paxap on a Focus Blast. Then I switch to Uwu, anticipating an Avalanche, which I plan to lock him into with Encore. Unfortunately, Obama Snow goes for Water Pulse. So, you know what that means. We're playing around Confusion again. I go for an Encore so that Obama Snow doesn't use Focus Blast. Originally, I was planning on setting up Cosmic Powers and staying healthy with Moonlight, but now that we're dealing with the chance of Confusion, I decide to just go for a Flamethrower. Flamethrower has exactly a 50% chance to kill the Obama Snow. Well, slightly more than 50% if you factor in the chance to crit. Unfortunately, Uwu low rolls and Obama Snow survives with a sliver. Then, Obama Snow hits a Water Pulse and gets the Prophesized Confusion. That's really inconvenient because Candace is going to heal. But I can't afford to hit myself in Confusion, so I switch to Paxap and Candace uses the Hyper Potion. Next turn, I decide to use a Stockpile. Then, I Baton Pass to Uwu. But Obama Snow gets another confusion. This is now the second gym battle that Uwu has been confused by Water Pulse more than once. 
She's cute, but she's clearly very easily confused by the concept of water. Well, it's time to go back to Paxap, because Abomasnow's encore is over. Then it's back to Uwu. This time, Abomasnow uses Avalanche, which actually hits pretty hard. I have to risk a crit here to lock him into Encore. Thankfully, there's no crit. Next, I heal with Moonlight, and... Uh, well, I, I may have forgotten that Hale halves the HP recovered by Moonlight. Remember what I said about not always being perfect? Well, there you go. I'm kind of pinned here. Nothing in the rest of my party can one-shot this Abomasnow. Avalanche does a lot of damage on the switch-in, and basically nothing can take the boosted Avalanche on the follow-up. Well, Colin D can, but he can't actually really do anything to Abomasnow in return. So it's kind of up to Uwu here. My only play is to click Flamethrower. It's basically a coin flip. Heads, Abomasnow dies. Tails, Uwu dies. So, I flip the coin. Tails. I have to watch in helpless terror as the light leaves Uwu's eyes. But unfortunately, there's no time to mourn. Her death needs to be avenged here. Colin D comes out and finishes off Abomasnow with a surf. Next is the terrifying Frostlass. Cloud9 removes the effects of Snowcloak, but Frostlass is able to outspeed and set up a double team. So Colin D misses his first surf. This is bad because we actually need two surfs to knock it out. On the next turn, Frostlass uses Shadow Ball, and we connect with our first Surf. Okay, one more to go. On the next turn, Frostlass hits a Shadow Ball, and we miss a second Surf. Now we're at risk to a crit, but there's nothing else I can do. I just have to risk it. Frostlass goes for a third Shadow Ball. Colin D survives with 6 HP, and then he connects with a Surf. Back against the wall, Colin D survives to avenge Uwu's death. After the frost last goes down, Pilliswine comes out, but it falls to a single surf, winning us the hardest Candice fight I've ever had. But the win did come at the price of my deepest fears coming true. Uwu is gone, and so too is the innocence she represented. From here on out, everything we do will be for her. She won't be truly avenged until Cynthia and all her ugly Pokemon are defeated. With a new sense of purpose, we continue our journey, which brings us to the climax of the story. I need to fight Cyrus at Galactic HQ, and he's actually pretty difficult, but we need to fight him again in like 5 minutes in the Distortion World, and he's even harder then. So we can just skip this fight, it goes fine. After defeating Cyrus and Saturn, I go ahead and release the Lake Guardians from their prison by pressing this button. Have you ever pressed this button after releasing the Lake Guardians? The dialogue is hilariously aggressive. Well, I listen to the button and make my way up to the top of Mount Cornet. There I'm challenged by Mars and Jupiter, which can be pretty annoying because Ugly comes to white knight the battle with you. Fortunately, Ugly's inclusion in this fight means that I can just recklessly spam Choice Specs boosted Surfs from Colon D. It does a huge chunk to Mars and Jupiter's Bronzors, as well as Ugly's Munchlax. The Bronzor sets up Reflect and Light Screen, and then on the next turn, another Surf knocks them both out, along with Ugly's Munchlax. So Mars brings in Perugly, Ugly brings in Infernape, and Jupiter brings in Jolbat. Since Infernape is actually pretty good, I don't really want to kill it with the Surf, so I switch to Colon 3. This ends up being a pretty good call because Infernape almost one-shots the Perugly with a close combat. On the next turn, I protect as Infernape goes down to an Aerial Ace. I don't want to kill the Floatzel with Discharge, so I just click Swift. Another good call because Floatzel sponges the Slash from Perugly and then hits a Brick Break to not only remove the screens, but also knock out the Perugly. Jolbat locks in Colon 3 with a mean look, so on the next turn, I go for a Protect, Floatzel misses an Iron Tail, and then gets knocked out. Staraptor is fourth for Ugly. I decide to go for a Discharge this turn, which almost kills Staraptor and also paralyzes it, but fortunately the Staraptor is still able to knock out the Jolbat with a takedown anyways. Another Discharge on the next turn knocks out the second Jolbat, as well as Ugly's Staraptor. So last is Skuntank, as Ugly brings in Heracross. I switch to Colon D, as Heracross hits a close combat. Skuntank retaliates with a Flamethrower, leaving Heracross with just a little bit of health. So I decide to spare the Heracross and use Ice Beam instead of Surf, which leaves Skuntank with a Sliver. This allows Heracross to get the finishing blow, and with that, Mars, Jupiter, as well as two-thirds of Ugly's team have been defeated. Next up, it's time for Cyrus to accidentally open a portal to the most tedious children's puzzle of all time. Eventually, I manage to chase down Cyrus, and he challenges me for a final time. This fight is always pretty tough, since most of his Pokémon are very speedy and hit pretty hard. At least we have two Electric-types to deal with his Gyarados. 
He leads with a Houndoom though, so Cole and Dee takes it out with a Surf before it can do anything. Seriously, Jolduck is pretty awesome. Gyarados is second, so I switch first to Paxap on the Earthquake, and then to Colon 3 on the Ice Fang. A Thunderbolt knocks out Gyarados in one shot. Third for Cyrus is Weavile, who's very scary. I switch to Analypse Zen on the Fake Out. Weavile outspeeds, but I'm safe to even a critical hit Ice Punch. A freeze here would be devastating, but fortunately we're safe. I retaliate with Drain Punch, which isn't enough for a one shot, but it does give us just enough health to survive even a critical hit Ice Punch. Which is good, because that's exactly what Cyrus gets on the next turn. No freeze though, so a second Drain Punch knocks it out. Fourth is Haunchcrow, so I switch to Colin D, who tanks a Night Slash. This now guarantees that Haunchcrow will use Drill Peck next, so I can safely switch to Colin Parentheses. Then Thunderbolt knocks out the Haunchcrow in one shot. Last is Crobat, so I switch to Paxap, who gets hit with a Toxic. Crobat uses Air Slash, and I retaliate with a Shadow Ball. Then I use Baton Pass. Since Paxap is slower than Crobat, this gives me a damageless switch to Colon D. So on the next turn, after Crobat hits a Toxic, an Ice Beam finishes it off, winning us the battle. With Cyrus defeated, it's time to confront the Lord of the Distortion World and save the universe. Giratina is angry, and ugly, so the only thing I can do to stop it from unleashing its power is to kill it. So we approach the Merciless Beast, and I do the only rational thing we can do. Well, with that over, we can take on Volkner, but the Jolteon he leads with makes this an incredibly easy battle to cheese with basically any ground type. All I really need is Analypse Zen and Smiley Face, but I decide to train everyone up to the level cap of 50 anyways, which turns out to be a very dumb decision because Paxap dies to a wild level 50 Tenacruel on Route 223. I didn't even know that the Tenacruel on Route 223 could be level 50, but this one was, so I couldn't outspeed it to escape, and it killed Paxap with a Hydro Pump. What a horrible way to lose an incredibly useful Pokemon. This doesn't obviously matter against Volkner, but it's pretty bad for the few remaining fights in the game. Our team's now permanently down to five members as we face off against Volkner. He leads Jolteon, and I lead Analypse's N. I start with an agility as Jolteon goes for a Thunder Wave. This is where my Cherry Berry would activate if Analypse's N didn't have literally the worst ability in the game. But fortunately, it doesn't matter because we're able to get a Baton Pass off on the next turn and switch to Smiley Face. Then I set up a Swords Dance as Jolteon misses an Iron Tail. From here, Smiley Face is able to outspeed and one-shot every single one of Volkner's Pokémon. His Electivire is the only one that could have survived a non-boosted Earthquake, but with a Swords Dance boost, it obviously doesn't stand a chance. That's the 8th and final gym defeated! Before taking on the Elite Four, we have to fight Ugly one last time. His team is pretty strong, and his Heracross is yet again a massive pain, especially without Paxap. Fortunately, because the level cap is based on Lucian, I can do this fight with a pretty heavy level advantage which frankly is very necessary. Ugly leads Staraptor, and I lead Colon D, who knocks it out with a single Ice Beam. As you can see, I forgot to turn battle animations back on here after a session of grinding. My bad. Roserade comes out next, but another Ice Beam knocks it out. Third is Infernate, so I use Surf, and it too goes down in one shot. Fourth is Heracross, and Colon D is just bulky enough to barely survive a critical hit close combat, so I'm able to stay in and knock it out with two Surfs. Fifth is Floatzel, so I switch to Colon 3 who tanks a crunch and then knocks out the Floatzel with the Thunderbolt. Last is Snorlax, so I switch to Smiley Face who takes a pitiful amount of damage from Earthquake. I miss a Leech Seed as Smiley Face gets hit with a Body Slam for a chunk of damage, but then on the next turn a Leech Seed connects. Snorlax hits another Body Slam and this one paralyzes Smiley Face, but a Cherry Berry heals the Paralysis. From here it's just a bit of Protect and Leech Seed stalling mixed with some Earthquakes. Body Slam does manage to paralyze again, so a few full paras would be really bad here, but we're able to hit an Earthquake after Snorlax uses Rest, so as it continues sleeping, I switch to Analypse Zen and finish it off with a return. And with that, Ugly has been defeated. Now all that's left is the Elite Four and the Champion. Here's our final team of five, leveled up to the final level cap of 59 to match Lucian's Gallade. Let's see if these cuties have what it takes. First up is A.A. Ron and he may unironically be the most challenging of the Elite Four members, because he too has a Heracross. And since it's a bit stronger than Ugly's Heracross, a critical hit close combat will absolutely kill Colon D before it can be taken out with two Surfs. And I really can't risk Colon D here for reasons that you'll see in a sec. So I have to come up with another strategy. The plan is to use Natural Gift and a Lumberry to give Smiley Face a one-time use 60 base power flying type move, 
which will be enough to one-shot Heracross before it can retaliate with a Megahorn. Unfortunately, getting Smiley Face in is still a bit of a problem. I start by leading with Colin D to one-shot a Aeron Zian Mega with a Surf, and then Heracross comes out. So the problem here is that Heracross knows both Close Combat and Megahorn, both of which do the same amount of damage into Colin D. If it uses Close Combat, I can safely switch to Smiley Face, who's able to tank it even if it crits. But if it's Megahorn, which is super effective to Smiley Face, a critical hit will kill me. So unfortunately, I need to pivot through another team member. And that burden falls on Cole in parentheses, who is the least useful member of our fivesome. So I switch her in, and Heracross retaliates with a Megahorn. It doesn't crit though, so Cole in parentheses survives the turn, just barely. Now the right play here is to let her go down and get a free switch into Smiley Face, but I, I just can't do it. Anecdotally, I think that the AI won't go for an inaccurate attack when another more accurate attack will also kill. I don't know if that's 100% true, but if it is, it means that I can safely switch into Smiley Face without risking a Megahorn. I decide to go with my gut and switch to Smiley Face. Colon parentheses lives, and thankfully Heracross goes for a Night Slash. For the record, this doesn't actually prove that I'm right, it just means that if I'm wrong, I wasn't punished. Which is good enough for me. A Lumberry boosted Natural Gift knocks out the Heracross on the next turn, and then Vespiquen comes out. So I switch to Colon D as Vespiquen goes for a Defense Order. Two Surfs are enough to take it out, but Vespiquen is able to get off a little bit of damage with Attack Order. Next is Scizor, so I switch to an Ellipsis N, who tanks an X Scissors. A Fire Punch one-shots the Scizor on the next turn, and then Drapion comes out. I go for an Agility, planning to Baton Pass to Smiley Face on the next turn so that we can one-shot it with Earthquake. But stupidly, I go to check Torterra's stats to make sure I'm able to one-shot it with Earthquake. And so instead of Baton Passing, I accidentally just directly switch. Which is really dumb, because Drapion knows Ice Fang, so I can't afford to stay in with Smiley Face if I don't outspeed. So I just switch to Colin D to tank an Ice Fang. Which freezes me. Finally punished for a stupid mistake, I guess. Well, there's no point in not staying in here. Fortunately, Colin D immediately thaws out and knocks out the Drapion with a Surf. So, I guess I actually didn't get punished, <laughs> but that was pretty lucky. Next is Bertha, but, uh, I mean, this is pretty easy stuff. Choice Specs boosted Surfs from Colin D knock out all of her Pokemon in one shot. Even Whiskash. The funny thing is that even if she had immediately set up a Sandstorm with Hippowdon to get the special defense boost on her rock types and Sand Veil on Glysaur, it wouldn't have mattered because Cloud9 negates those effects anyways. This was pretty unlosable. I could see how you might think that Choice Specs is pretty overpowered here. I've seen that comment on a couple of my videos before, but using Choice Specs doesn't really detract from the experience for me. And since these challenges above all are meant to be fun for me, I don't see a reason to not use it. Anyways, that's Bertha defeated. Next is Flint, so I lead an Ellipsis N to set up an agility as Howdoom uses Sunny Day. Then I baton pass to Colin D as Howdoom uses Flamethrower, which does do a chunk. With the agility boost, Colin D is now able to outspeed and one-shot Flint's entire team with Surf. And again, since he has the ability Cloud 9, Surf's damage isn't even weakened by the Sunny Day. So, that's Flint defeated. Last for the Elite Four is Lucian. He leads Mr. Mime, who can be a bit annoying because he sets up screens. I lead an Ellipsis N and use Agility as Mr. Mime goes for a Reflect. So I use Protect a few times to stall out turns of Reflect. And then I Baton Pass to Smiley Face. Unfortunately, I forgot that I needed to set up a Swords Dance before killing the Mr. Mime, so I actually miscounted Reflect turns, and Mr. Mime is able to get another Reflect up. So I gotta stall out the second Reflect now. This is also bad because it means I need to risk being hit by another critical hit Psychic as I go for another Swords Dance. Fortunately, Mr. Mime just goes for a Light Screen on that turn. So, one more Protect stalls another turn of Reflect, and then an Earthquake knocks out the Mr. Mime as the Reflect fades. Espeon comes out, but I outspeed and kill it with an Earthquake. Then Bronzong comes out, but it has Levitate, so I have to use a Fire-type Natural Gift from a Bluckberry to knock it out. After that, it's just two more Earthquakes to finish off the Alakazam and the Gallade. And that's Lucian and the Elite Four defeated. The last thing to do is take on Cynthia, but the plan is to set up another Baton Pass sweep with an Ellipsis N and Smiley Face. Setup sweeping may not be the most exciting strategy, but most of the time it's by far the safest strategy. And even then, it's not necessarily easy to guarantee the sweep. We're gonna try to set up on Cynthia's Spiritomb, 
But that's ended very poorly for me in the past, when Spiritomb got a Silver Wind Omni boost and then a critical hit Psychic. Fortunately, I've learned from my past experiences. Plus, the last Cynthia wipe was in Diamond, whereas the Platinum AI is much better, so it's less likely to go for random Silver Winds that happen to give it an Omni boost. So, I approach the final challenge of this run, and the iconic music begins. She leads Spiritomb, and I lead an Ellipses N. I start with a Captivate to lower Spiritomb's special attack. Then I set up an Agility, and then I set up a Substitute. So on the next turn, I use Baton Pass to switch to Smiley Face. Another Dark Pulse does break the sub, but this means I'm able to get Smiley Face in without damage. Next is the scary part. I set up Swords Dance as Spiritomb uses Silver Wind. No Omni Boost. I set up another Swords Dance as Spiritomb uses another Silver Wind. Great. Neither of those gave Spiritomb an Omni Boost, and it didn't get a critical hit either. But honestly, I think that she would have needed to get a double crit, or a double Omni Boost and one crit, for that to even knock me out. So it was pretty safe, even if it wasn't fully guaranteed. Well, from here it's over. Earthquake takes out the Spiritomb, and then Togekiss comes out. Since I can't use Earthquake, I use an Electric-type Natural Gift from a Weperberry to knock it out in one shot. After that, each and every one of Cynthia's Pokémon falls to an Earthquake. If Spiritune had gotten one critical hit, it's possible that Smiley Face would have been in range of an extreme speed critical hit from Lucario, but he doesn't even go for it here since Smiley Face is at such high HP. So, with a final Earthquake, Smiley Face knocks out Cynthia's Roserade, winning us the battle and the run. I really enjoyed this challenge. I didn't play the best I possibly could, but I really liked the Pokémon that I got to use, and there was a surprising number of challenges that I wasn't expecting. The monotype challenges are really difficult and entertaining, but it's also really fun to be able to use a theme where I can play with a more rounded team and come up with more complex team strategies. I'll definitely still be doing monotype challenges now and again, but expect more of these types of themed challenges. You know, assuming you like them. So with that in mind, be sure to keep recommending all types of challenges. Some of the stuff that you all come up with is pretty awesome, and I'm hoping to get to as many as I can. In the meantime, if you enjoyed watching, please like the video and subscribe. Or don't. I don't know. But I do know that you should follow me on Twitter and Twitch to keep up with streams of my future challenges. And you should also join the Flygon HG Community Discord where you can discuss Nuzlocking and make recommendations for future challenges. The link is in the description. Stay tuned for more Nuzlocke videos, and until then, remember to always, always, always play around the critical hit.